Okay, uh, it is 4.02, uh, so we're going to get started. So welcome to Biology 107. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, before I get started, I just want to go over a couple of things about Zoom. I have it, uh, basically I have it programmed to set up so that your microphone is muted automatically. That way, if every time somebody snuffles or sneezes, or when their dog barks or their door shuts in the background, I'm not going to hear all that stuff. But if you do have a question uh, during the lectures, please do turn your microphone on and, and ask me. Um, there is a chat function on Zoom, but quite honestly, I probably won't notice if you type something in. Um, and uh, so it's just better if you actually just interrupt me and, and talk to me. Uh, so I want to, uh, and before I get into class, just a little bit of a Zoom etiquette. I don't know if your other instructors have gone through this with you. Um, so I mentioned the microphone part. Uh, hopefully you can get that sorted out if you are having technical difficulties. Um, obviously I can't be there on, uh, on your end to help you out with that. Uh, something else is clothing, by the way, is not optional. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, some people like to sit around in their pajamas or other things, but just keep in mind what you're wearing because other people may see you if you do turn on your video. You do not have to turn on your video, but something that might be helpful for me is if you uh, with the zoom account actually put a nice picture or photo of yourself and then at least I can connect uh, the name to the face that would be very useful on my end and uh, obviously uh, be aware of your background if you do have your video on if there's uh, you know people in the background uh, particularly again if they're wearing something like a bathrobe that may not be so pleasant for them to, to be on screen for everyone to see um, be respectful I think that goes without saying, uh, be respectful to your colleagues, your classmates, to your instructor, those kind of things. And uh, lastly, please do participate. Uh, this is uh, not ideal uh, being online teaching or being a student in pretty much any form. We're missing on the interactions. And unfortunately for me, this is the best part of the job is interacting with students. And so it's pretty much been taken away uh, entirely due to the situation. So we'll try to make the best of this. Uh, so today I want to talk about the course outline, what's expected of you, and, and uh, we'll, we'll actually start the first lecture a little bit too. So let me see here, I gotta figure out how to share my screen again. Okay, uh, I think, there we go, that should do it. Okay, so this is uh, Biology 107, uh, Introduction to Cell Biology, and uh, hopefully you know that already. Okay, let's see here. So there we go, there's a picture of me, that's what I look like. And uh, hopefully I will uh, just admit someone else to the meeting. Hopefully I'll get to know you all a little bit, at least I'll get to know your work as you hand it in. Uh, so a little bit about me, I am uh, originally from Ontario, came to Fort McMurray 12 years ago. I did my PhD in uh, microbiology, so I study bacteria and things like that. So if you have any questions about uh, coronaviruses and things like that, uh, probably know more about those things than anybody else you know. And at least there's a good chance I do. Um, and uh, I love this stuff, by the way. I love cell biology, I love microbes, I love science. So I hope that you do enjoy this class and you find it useful for your future studies. Uh, if you take a look on there, I have um, my office hours. Uh, so if you're trying to get a hold of me, email is always best. But uh, if you are looking for something uh, you need to talk to me in person. Uh, do call me during my office hours or set up an appointment. So I think I have some pictures here to show you. There are some pictures of some of the research I was involved in a number of years ago. You can see on the left there's some bacteria, some wild type cells, and I made some mutants. And the mutants uh, severely affected the cell wall structure, and they ended up being uh, kind of these spherical cells. And so those are my mutant babies, I call them, and very proud of them. It took a lot of work to, to get that far. And I have some nice pictures of them to show you. Uh, let's see here. So let's talk about the class, Biology 107. So here's the textbook right here. So this is a brand new uh, edition. This is the third Canadian edition. Um, this is a great textbook. Uh, this is probably one of the best textbooks I've ever owned. I didn't have the third Canadian edition when I was a student, but it is a very good textbook. Uh, if you take further biology courses, uh, it's the kind of thing that you go back to again and again. It's a very good textbook. Um, it's expensive, so don't feel that you 
can afford it or you don't want to buy the third edition, uh, the first edition and the second edition are perfectly fine. Uh, and they're also fine for Biology 108. So if you do take Biology 108 next semester or if you're taking it this semester, uh, you can use the same textbook for both courses. Um, there are digital versions and there are other biology textbooks out there that will probably be okay as well. Uh, just ask me about them if you have any, any questions. So, by the way, you may have noticed this is a thick textbook, right? They're just trying to give you a lot of bang for your buck. Let's see here, how many chapters are we looking at? 37, 38, huge. So you're probably wondering, do I have to read the whole thing? That would be lovely, but I, I understand that, you know, you're taking probably five classes and you probably have five textbooks, maybe not quite as thick as this one, and you're wondering when you're ever going to get the chance to sleep. Well, welcome to university. You don't get to sleep. Well, maybe you get to sleep, but then you have to give up something else, like your social life or your grades. So you've got to pick two of those three things, right? <laughs> That's the big joke. So how do I expect to use the textbook? Okay, so we're going to start talking about uh, chapter one uh, right away. And uh, so if you have the textbook, flip to that chapter, um, take a look at the pages that I'm recommending. And, uh, you know, if there's something that you didn't understand in the lecture, this is where you want to go to the textbook and uh, fill out the notes. The textbook has a big glossary. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in it. Um, do you need 100%? No, I would not say you need 100%. It's just highly recommended. Uh, my notes are very good. Uh, if you want to hold off uh, buying it or if you want to share a copy with somebody, that's great too. Like I said, there's lots of used copies floating around of Campbell's Biology and other biology textbooks. You can always ask me about it. Uh, so what are we going to learn about in this course? All sorts of things. You can see this is talking about the learning outcomes. We're going to learn all about prokaryotes and eukaryotes and those kind of things. Um, where there is a focus on technical writing in this course. Uh, so that's going to be where the lab is, is at, where you're going to analyze data and, and write about it. And uh, obviously you'll have some exams on that. So we'll talk about the labs in a couple of minutes. So this is really the evaluation. So you can see uh, really you've got about a month before we're going to have a midterm. Uh, and then we're going to have a second midterm early November. Uh, we're going to talk about the lab in a minute, and uh, the final exam will be uh, uh, scheduled by the uh, registrar. So I don't have a date for that yet. Hopefully they will have a date for that soon. So I know everybody here probably wants that A+. Plus, but I want to talk about, uh, you know, how, uh, what the difference is between these, these grading systems. So you can see, first of all, the thing to point out is the C- minus I have written on there. Uh, in red and in bold, because uh, most of the transfer institutions, at least I know University of Alberta, uh, the minimum requirement they're looking at is a C minus for your uh, for your grade. So if you get a D plus, they're not going to accept the credit. Um, I'm not, it's not going to be the true fault institutions, but I do recommend that at a minimum, if you're going for a C minus, they may require something a little higher depending on the program and the availability of seats and things like that. Um, the average grade in this course uh, usually is somewhere around a B minus C plus area. So just so you know, if you're getting better than a B minus, you are probably above average. And uh, if you look at my rubric here, that really is what uh, is what it's saying is that uh, an acceptable performance is what C is. Uh, a B is above average and A's are excellent. And an A plus is really somebody who's consistently excellent and has that extra depth and breadth of uh, understanding. By the way, I'm in a classroom. I just prefer standing as opposed to sitting at my desk all day. So, um, you know, if I'm looking weird through the video, that's why. So this is what the lecture schedule looks like. The first part of the lecture, we're going to cover, you know, kind of the bits and pieces and parts of cells and how we study them. So things like microscopy. Then we're going to have our midterm. Second part of the course, we're going to cover things like respiration and photosynthesis, and mitosis and meiosis. And then we're going to have our second midterm. And then the last part of the course is all dealing with, uh, uh, basically dealing with information. Uh, so DNA and RNA and, and what happens, uh, you know, after it makes proteins and how that's regulated and those kind of things. And at the end of the course, we have a couple kind of, uh, you know, bonus units that I think are the best part of the course. Where we're going to talk about uh, biotechnology and we're going to talk about viruses. Viruses are just are wonderful. I can't wait till we talk about viruses. Then we'll have our final exam. So if you're not done so already, uh, it's very important that you go to Moodle. Uh, so Moodle is, uh, there's the link for there. You can also find the link at the Canna home page and you're going to find a whole bunch of things there. I'm just going to go to the Moodle page right now and uh, show you what it looks like if you have not been there already. Uh, so here it is. So there's the Moodle page. 
And um, so you can see, hold on, I'm just trying to get this, my video out of my way so I can see this whole thing. Uh, so you can see there's the Moodle page. If you scroll down, you'll find your courses. So there's my courses. So you can click on it, loads up, there's Biology 107. So there's the welcome letter I sent to you an email. There's a departmental orientation video. Um, it's a little long, maybe not as exciting to watch than other things you might see out there on YouTube. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's some important information there. Now the course outline, course outline of course has, uh, has all your uh, dates, uh, my contact information and other important things. So it, it's a good idea for you to take a look at it. And there's a link for the Zoom lectures. And uh, I am uh, recording these lectures, so I will eventually have a link and I'll, I'll make a playlist in YouTube for everyone to, uh, uh, in case you miss a lecture and, and whatnot. And down here, you can see I'm gonna be starting to put the notes for the classes. So uh, the way it works is I have my notes in two formats. Uh, all my notes are in PDFs and I'll have uh, all of those posted for the first six topics, uh, uh, probably in the next day or two. And you can see uh, what it looks like. It's mostly text. There's a lot of information there, uh, lots of white space. So what I think is probably a good idea for you to do is download these, print them off, have the paper in front of you, and they are gonna follow the PowerPoints. And the PowerPoints are gonna be mostly pictures, uh, but it's gonna cover the same information. So have them side by side and take notes. Uh, the hard thing with uh, learning online, you're sitting there, you're at home, there's distractions, there's ice cream in the fridge, there's, uh, you know, maybe your cat, uh, you probably have your cell phone, you're looking on Instagram or Snapchat. What I want you to do is I want you to focus in class on biology. So take notes. That is one of the best ways for you to retain information. If you just listen to something, you're probably only going to retain maybe five, maybe 8% if you're a really good listener. Uh, you can double that easily just by taking notes, even if you never look at those notes ever again. If you take good notes and study those notes, uh, all of this is gonna help you out. Uh, I'm gonna point out something else in Moodle here. Um, I do have some laboratory information. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and this is where it's found. So just, you just need to scroll down uh, to find the laboratory information. So I'm just gonna go back to the Moodle homepage. And I wanted to point out, uh, if you look over here, um, and if you look to the, uh, to the right, so I'm looking over here, it says student, uh, right here, it says plagiarism tutorial certificate. Uh, so that's something you'll need to do for all your classes in this department is basically do that uh, plagiarism recognition course. Uh, once you get the certificate, you can, um, you can give it to your instructors and because uh, we're not going to accept any assignments until you actually have that done. So if you're looking for that and you haven't done it already, uh, that's a place for you to start. So let me go back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, how do I do that so New share, there's the PowerPoint. So Moodle is the place. Uh, by the way, that's also the environment that you're gonna find your, uh, your midterm exams. They're gonna be online through the Moodle system. Uh, more details to come, still figuring all this stuff out. So there is the uh, lab schedule, and uh, that's something that I'm still figuring out in terms of how we're going to do the labs. Uh, obviously, they're not going to be done in, in person, so uh, what I'm going to do is for every lab, I'm going to be filming uh, some demos, and it's, most of the lab is going to focus on um, you analyzing data and, uh, and, and, and writing reports. Um, so if you take a look, the way it works is the first couple of labs, uh, you have what is called a short report. So you have one short report for labs one and two. And it is going to be, uh, it's relatively short. It's, it's maybe about three pages worth of, uh, you know, you're, you're making a table, you're answering a few questions. Uh, you may have some introduction type questions, maybe some data type questions, and maybe some discussion type questions. Uh, for lab three, you're going to do a formal report. Uh, and that is going to be a major component of this course. I can't remember the exact evaluation. It's 12 to 15% of your overall grade is that formal report. So formal report is gonna have an introduction, it's going to have a methods section, it's gonna have a results section, a discussion section, and you're gonna have references and all that. And so we'll talk about that as, as we go along, uh, how, that, uh, how that report is gonna work. Uh, there is a laboratory exam at the end, 
Uh, usually it's a lot more practical. I haven't decided what I'm doing for it yet, um, but we have a few weeks to, uh, to figure that thing out uh, so far. So we'll get to that when we get to that. And I will talk a little bit more about labs next week once I get myself a little bit more organized. So I wanted to show you this because we are going to be online and we're trying to figure out exactly how to do this and all of you want to be uh, successful students. Um, this was a list, uh, this was a workshop I went to a few years ago and they were talking about what do good students look like and they had this list here. And so I want to just share a few things with you. Uh, active listening, like I said, it's going to be important that you do focus on, on, on biology during this hour. Um, you know, if, if, if you find me really boring, I, I, I really apologize for that, or I do guarantee I'm much better in person. But what you can do, if you know, oh, that's the time to open your textbook. That's the time to make some notes. Uh, you know, take a look at the biology stuff, at least during that hour. Don't squander your time. Uh, you know, you only have so many hours in a day, and you do want to sleep eventually, and you will be very busy uh, this year. And, uh, you know, so I do encourage you to do what you can to, uh, you know, do that listening. Maybe you're eating your breakfast. That will keep you awake, too. Critical thinking. So we are going to think about data a little bit. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Handling procrastination. Um, part of that has to do with uh, test preparation and assignment doing. It's really important that you don't do all your tests, all your studying for your tests and do all your assignments just the night before. Um, you know, we are looking at university quality material now. I'm not looking for grade nine quality material. So if you're handing me garbage, you're gonna get garbage marks. Uh, just being honest with you. You know, most of these things, you should be working uh, through them over a couple of days, uh, at least in order to make sure the quality is, is good. And so we will talk a lot about report writing and uh, I'll give you some tips on that as we, as we go along. Uh, note taking, I mentioned that. I'll have some things to say about that in a minute here. Uh, writing and editing, so that has to do with uh, lab reports, test preparation. Uh, so that's something you know, we're going to have to figure out in terms of uh, you know, how to help you study better for this class. So I talked about notes already. Why, why take notes? I think I already told you. You want to remember things, right? You want to organize your thoughts. I have some, some uh, points here, right? Uh, you know, it's super important for memory that you do do something constructive. If you're just passive with something, if you're just sitting there passively, uh, like I said, you only retain so much. But when you take notes, you're actually organizing things. Uh, you're organizing them for your brain and your help forming long-term memories. And that's really what you want to do. You want to have uh, memories so that you can, uh, can do well for the test. Uh, I'd mentioned there's a lot of white space on my, uh, uh, on my notes, so you can use those, or you can use your own paper. And uh, generally when I teach this course, I do write a lot of notes on the board. I'm gonna have to come around with some compromises for this. Uh, and, uh, uh, but do take notes during class. And usually, uh, so this is the Cornell method. They say, leave some space. And then later you can come along and review. And later you can reflect and write questions and definitions and things like that. Uh, and you know, if there's something you don't understand, obviously get back to me. So there's just an idea around some note taking. But do take notes. It keeps you active, keeps you awake, and uh, helps you to remember in the long run. OK, so I have this uh, little quick little video I want to show you all about learning. I just want to make sure, let's see here. I think I've got to check that the volume is on. OK, so I'm going to play this for you, and, and hopefully you find it informative. And, and like I said, I'm going to try to give you lots of tips about learning and, and studying as we go along. I know some of you guys are, are awesome. You know how to study really well. Other people are probably still uh, trying to figure some things out, how your brain works or even what the best methods are. I would say if we were to make one shift to help people learn, it would be to experience messages and ideas and read the research that shows you that everyone can learn really anything. <laughs> What we need to work on in this country is getting comfortable with struggle in learning, with the discomfort that comes from not knowing something. I think the hardest thing that our students have of whatever age is that need to be right first thing. That need to, to know what the rules are, to know what success is going to be immediately, means that there's no discovery. I've, I've always believed that people who are great at learning are, are curious people. 
right? They, 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 they want to ask questions. And so um, I think that's what we can all do is we can, we can uh, build the discipline of curiosity. We can build the discipline of, of asking questions for ourselves. One of the neat things about our brain is as we sleep, everything that we learned th uh, through the previous day, that gets encoded into long-term memory. And so if you want to make your practice more efficient, uh, that is, remember more about what to do the next day than you did. Oops, sorry. Not me, I didn't pause it. Knew the, the day before. If you practice right before you go to sleep, you're making the most of that practice session. Recently, we've found that if you have belief in yourself, your brain actually operates differently when you do math. And it is the kids who believe in themselves who cope better when they make a mistake. Their brains actually spark and fire because they know mistakes are good. Part of the problem with education today is it's, we, we're sort of force-fed the questions. We're, we're, it's, it's overly structured. Kids get used to being asked the questions rather than asking them for themselves. I think that's a problem. I think certainly when it comes to creativity, uh, the, 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 the sort of step one of any creative process is asking a really interesting question, often a question that challenges assumptions or reframes the problem. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's the discipline we all need to work on. A very good way of helping people understand the world around them is by stories, because that takes you to different times and places and gets you into the minds of other people, so you see things in different ways. Um, moreover, stories actually enhance your attention span, and for very young children, they help you develop an imagination, none of which, in fact, I would argue, the screen not only doesn't do that, but is actually bad because you're having these literal images in front of your face rather than that wonderful you know, thing when the mum says, oh, once upon a time, there was a fairy princess. Yeah, and you're ready. I think any adult even feels excited by that. Okay, yeah, so just uh, that was mostly just to give you some thoughts about learning in general because ultimately that's what I want to see you do. Whether you go on in biology or not, I want to see you learn and... Uh, I want to see you, uh, you know, expand your mind around uh, all sorts of things. Obviously, I care more about biology than some other areas, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what I want you to do. I want to see you learn. Okay. For some reason I can't advance. Oh, there we go. So a few more things. Um, you want to survive. You want to do well, right? So coming to class is, is obviously a good idea. Um, I'll be honest with you. I do give a lot of tips uh, in your midterms and things like that. And, Sometimes I make hints, sometimes I make promises. So coming to class is important. Uh, things that I do, uh, I take notes around. Uh, um, those are, are obviously very important. I'm not just writing them out because I like to do it. I'm writing it out because I want you to know that it's important. Uh, ask questions, uh, give me a call during my office hours. Those kind of things are gonna help you. Uh, you know, if you have friends in the course, discuss with them. You know, how many hours a week are you spending on biology? How many hours a week are you spending on chemistry? Uh, those kind of things help, you know, so that you can uh, figure out, you know, what they're doing and how they're, how they're succeeding. It's always good to exchange ideas. A few more things, something to think about, right? Um, in terms of multitasking, right? Uh, like I said, it's always a good idea to focus on, you know, one thing at a time. If you're uh, multitasking and checking Facebook or Instagram or whatever, um, you know, you really, what your brain is doing is it's switching back and forth between two things. And uh, it's a good idea to really, you know, spend this time, like I said, I want you to spend this time on, on my class, uh, you know, while we're here so that, uh, you know, I'm not wasting your time, you're not wasting my time. If you have any tips on my end, you know, if there's something that can be done better, particularly with the technology, please let me know. If there's something that you like or dislike, uh, you know, those are always, always useful things too. I'm trying to figure this online stuff out myself. I've never done it before. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that uh, I, can, I can do a good job and, and at least uh, you know, make you, uh, the lectures worthwhile for you. So another thing that I would like you to do is download this app on your phone or your tablet or whatever. Uh, it's not necessary to download it. You can use a web browser if you really need to, but uh, I, I don't know if you've used Kahoot before. Um, but this is like a little game we're going to play. I'm hoping to do it once or twice a week where we have a little game. It's like little quizzes and, you know, if you answer quickly, you get extra points. And so it will be a little bit of competition as well. Um, so download the app. Uh, we're going to use it in, in this class. Uh, and uh, I have one that I'm going to do at the end of today. So if you download it now, um, maybe we can do it in about 10 minutes. 
And here's some more fun donut mitosis. Yay, who does not like donuts? Everyone likes donuts and everyone likes mitosis. So it's a win-win for everybody. Okay, so I think that is kind of it for the course outline. Don't forget to take a look at the course outline. And uh, you know, if there's something important there, because uh, I'm probably forgetting to tell you some things. Uh, so do take a look at the course outline. Uh, and, uh, and do ask questions uh, if you need to. I will do my best to remind you of deadlines and things like that that are coming up and to uh, tell you what's important for tests, but it is very important that you do look at the course outline uh, and, and ask any questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions at this time? Okay, so I'm gonna move on. And uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, I am going to uh, start the first topic, and uh, really this is relatively introductory stuff, so I am suspecting that uh, probably nothing new we'll talk about today, but I just want to uh, get into some introductory stuff and get moving on, on the course. Uh, starting next day, I will be probably writing some notes, uh, uh, not on the whiteboard behind me, but I'll, I'll be doing notes uh, virtually somehow. I'm still figuring uh, those details out. So topic one is all about an introduction to the cell, a little bit of history, uh, a little bit of um, uh, scientific method, and um, you know, those kind of things. So let's take a look at that. So there we are somewhere over there in North America. And uh, so you probably, uh, you're familiar with some of these words and terms. So if you take biology 108, uh, this is what you're going to look at. In Biology 108, it's all about ecology and ecosystems and uh, kind of the bigger, you know, pieces of biology. Uh, evolution, you know, is talked about in Biology 108 as well. Uh, in this class, we're more or less looking way down there at the cell level. We're not even going to talk about tissues so much. So there's a cell. You can even uh, break it down further. You have organelles, you have uh, uh, atoms and molecules and things like that. So what is a cell, right? You know, everyone thinks about cells, part of biology, right? So, so what is it, you know? If you go back to like, I don't know, grade four, they say it's like a Lego block, it builds the body, right? So, you know, that's, that's not too bad. That's a pretty good, good definition, it's a building block. Um, you know, if we want to uh, put a little more detail on it, you can see there, there's my definition there, right? Basic building block of, of all living things. Um, you, you know, it really is the, the basic unit of life in terms of uh, carrying out life's processes. So if you think about life's processes, or at least on a small level, things like respiration, photosynthesis, uh, you know, DNA uh, processes, those all happen at the level of the cell. Uh, some organisms are one cell, like a bacterium is one cell, a lot of protists are one cell, and uh, the human body is, of course, trillions of cells. I think the count is somewhere around 37 trillion, which is Huge, it's a very big number, you can't count that high. Uh, what are these functions that we're talking about? So you got things like structure, if you think about things like you've got uh, uh, cells in your body that are providing bone and cartilage and connective tissue. Uh, you've got cells that are uh, involved in metabolism, digestion of nutrients and growth. All sorts of specialized functions like red blood cells. And of course, cells have our DNA and hereditary material. So this course, we're going to be talking about cells, uh, lots of types. So, so plant cells, animal cells, protists, and bacteria uh, are going to be a big part of uh, the theme, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Uh, we're going to talk about organelles, and we're going to talk a lot about molecules as well. So topic two, I think, is, I think it's topic two anyway, is, uh, is, is basically a little bit of a chemistry review um, with a focus on macromolecules. So hopefully that will be a review for you as well. By the way, for the first few topics, I'll probably go through relatively fast before slowing down because I'm on the assumption that uh, a lot of this is going to be review, uh, but I will slow down eventually. If I am going too fast, like I said, please interrupt me and, and ask me questions because that's uh, how, I, how I get feedback on and knowing what you're doing. So cell biology, study of these small things. I kind of like this slide here because it shows you all these small things. You can see there's a dog there on the right and uh, you know cells are, are, are here in the middle. So you can see we've got a human egg right there. We've got a paramecium right there. And uh, so those things are kind of just within the perspective that the human eye can just make them out. 
So most of these things over here, so the rest of this over here, are things that we need a microscope, and in some cases, an electron microscope to see. I want to show you this tool here. Uh, it's it's a, a linked at the bottom. It's called the, the, um, the scale of the universe. This is like super cool. Uh, how do I share here? A new share. Okay, right there. So let's see here. So this is it. This is a super cool tool. Uh, you can check out this website. You can actually, there's an app you can download as well. It costs a couple of bucks. I actually paid for it and because uh, it's just, it's really cool. You can zoom in and out on the universe. So let me show you. So you can see there's a human. And actually, if you click on the human, there's a little note. And, you know, they sometimes gives you some information. And, you know, he says, I'm assuming you are also a human. I'm a human too. Did you know there's 7 billion of us? And so he gives you a little bit of information. So you can click on these things and see what they are. So that thing there is a Japanese spider crab. I had no idea those things existed. They are massive. So you can, you can play with this thing. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. So I'll zoom out a little bit. You can see, for example, there's a bunch of man-made features. Sorry if I'm going a little fast on this. It's hard to do this on a touch screen of my finger. So you can compare a human to an elephant and a Tyrannosaurus rex. There's a blue whale, some man-made objects here. Like I said, Eiffel Tower, Statue of Liberty, the Great Pyramids. And you can zoom out and you can see, like I said, this is the scale of the universe. All sorts of things. There's Rhode Island. Uh, what was that? That is Hydra. I don't know what that is. Some sort of moon, I guess. There's some other heavenly objects, and eventually we're going to see Earth. There's Earth. Asia is huge. Huge part of Earth is Asia there. Uh, you can keep zooming out. This is the part I think is funny. Anyone see that? The Minecraft world is apparently bigger than our entire planet. Uh, crazy. You can zoom right out, see all these nebula and planets and stars, and it's, it's really uh, each of them you can click on. It gives you a little bit of information on it. What I want to do is zoom in. We're going to zoom in and we're going to look at small things. So there's the human, right? We're zooming in slowly here. You can see there's a mouse and a quail egg and a square inch. Uh, and we are going into the level of the cell. So right there, you can see that circle is 10 to the minus 3 meters. So that's one millimeter. And uh, so you can see that uh, there's a dust mite there, which is smaller than a millimeter. Let me just zoom in a little bit more. So there's our human egg, our, our ovum, uh, and uh, above that, uh, that brown thing, you can see it says here, width of the human hair. So that's an, that's an actually very good uh, size to think about. That's 100 micrometers. So what is a micrometer? A micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter, or one millionth of a meter. So it's 10 to the minus 6 meters is what a micrometer is. And we're going to talk a lot about micrometers. Uh, so this is 100 micrometers. If you take a look at that gray circle right here in the middle, uh, that gray circle is, it says, the smallest object visible to the naked eye. So human hair is about the uh, resolution of the human eye. It means anything smaller than that or skinnier, uh, you're, you probably can't see. Obviously, some of us have slightly better vision than others, but that's about the limit of the human eye. So that means everything else here is too small. We need a microscope. So you can see there's a skin cell. Uh, we have a cell nucleus, a white blood cell, a mitochondria, chloroplast, all those cell parts. There's E. coli. E. coli is one of my favorite things, by the way. Uh, e. coli is about one micrometer. So 10 to the minus 6 meters in width and about 2 to 3 in, in length. So I'm just going to go into this dot. You can see that gray dot. Smallest thing visible to an optical microscope. So normal light microscope. After this, everything is too small. So viruses, there's HIV, hepatitis B. There's a membrane, there's DNA. And you can check this thing out. It's so much fun. You can go really far in if you want. There's quarks and atoms and nuclei and all sorts of things in there. Uh, so definitely something that you should check out. It's a really fun, uh, really, really fun tool. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint here. And uh, so I just want to talk a little bit today about uh, um, history of, of cell biology. And uh, that's about where we're going to finish off today. So where do cells come from? So as I mentioned, most of these things we can't see unless you have a microscope. So microscopes were invented around the 1500s at some time. And actually, most people building lenses were making telescopes. Uh, so most people were not looking at, at very small things. Uh, this guy was an exception. This is Robert Hooke. If you've taken physics and you've learned about Hooke's law, this is the same guy. Uh, 
and uh, he owned a telescope and he owned a microscope. And so you can see, uh, you know, he was basically looking at things. He was a rich guy with, uh, with all the fun toys and started looking at things and he started publishing. So there's this microscope there. You can see you have an ocular lens over here, an objective lens down here. This little thing is an oil lamp and the specimen would of course be, uh, be focused down. There's a little, uh, this little lever here. You could move the specimen closer or further to, uh, to focus it with the lens. So what was he looking at? All sorts of cool things, right? All those things that are small and we love to look at, you know, uh, insect eyeballs, fleas, uh, snowflakes, those kind of things. Uh, one of the things he did look at was cork. So cork, like we'd have it in a, in a bottle of wine, um, is actually an aquatic animal found in the ocean. And um, so he's looking at the cork and he sees these little boxes and he's like, okay, this kind of looks like cells, you know, prison cells or cells that monks would live in. And, uh, and so he, he named the term cells. And of course, lots of people were like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. And his book was very popular at the time because he, he's actually, looks like he's a very good artist. These are his drawings, by the way, Hook's actual drawings. So there was another guy uh, so Hook was an Englishman, by the way. This guy is a Dutchman, uh, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, um, another rich guy. This, he, he owned a, a dry goods store, so cloth and leather and things like that. And had a lot of time on his hands. Uh, and it turned out van Leeuwenhoek was very good at making microscopes, or at least the lenses. So um, it turns out he was so good that people could, that there's no one on the planet at the time that was known to make good lenses like that. And it took people a hundred years to be able to catch up to the quality because he, whatever he did, he took it to his grave. Um, his, his microscopes are not that sophisticated. You can see there's a picture on the bottom. And if you take a look, there's the lens right there. So his, his microscope is, is really just a lot like a fancy magnifying glass. It had a, a little lens in there. Um, there's some, uh, control knobs to, to move the sample and focus it up and down and really he's just using the sunlight uh, uh, to focus on things. So Van Leeuwenhoek apparently made hundreds of these in his lifetime. He made a couple hundred of these microscopes. There's only actually a dozen or two uh, still existent today and uh, he started looking at everything and anything. So here's one of the things that he looked at. I'm just going to play this video for you. There we go. And it was rainwater. Right? So, you know, you think about rainwater and, uh, you know, the thought was back in that time as well, what could, you know, it's pure, it's, it's wonderful, it's water, you know, what could be more pure than rainwater? And he looked at it and he couldn't, well, he couldn't help but wonder all these things he was seeing. And there were little tiny things and he, he said they were kind of like, you know, tiny animals or, you know, in, in English people translate to animacules. So that's kind of like a combination of molecules and animals. So we call them animacules. Uh, tiny little aquatic beasts. Uh, he started looking at all sorts of things. I'll show you some pictures of some of the things he's looking at. So water hydras and rotifers and paramecium, uh, all sorts of things you would find in water samples. Uh, he started making amazing biological discoveries. So think about all of the things um, Hook was looking at things that we could already see. Van Loo and Hook was looking at things that, that we had not even suspected there was something in there. At the time, people just thought blood was a red sticky substance, right? Uh, and so he looks, and there's cells in there. Uh, he, he looked at his own feces. He looked at his own feces when he was sick and saw differences. Um, so he was discovering all sorts of interesting things about biology. He was the first person to, that we know to actually see sperm. Uh, and uh, so again, there's a pretty massive biological discovery in terms of human reproduction. Uh, we also believe he was the first person to actually visualize bacteria, uh, which is very impressive. And uh, so this, this, was, uh, this was very important, uh, some very important discoveries. So of course, you know, people are like, what are these things, these cells? Uh, where are they coming from? Uh, what, what are they doing? Uh, are, are they important? Um, and so there was a bit of a debate around the 17th century around something called uh, spontaneous generation. So it, it sounds really weird now, but there were people were just not routinely being scientific about things. Uh, people would make observations and that was kind of the end of most of their knowledge, right? So, you know, where do mice come from, right? Now, a lot of people, you know, realize, you know, they were farmers and you realize that, you know, you've got a mama mouse and a daddy mouse and they do their thing and now you have baby mouse, mice. 
But uh, a lot of people were really stuck on this idea of spontaneous generation. So there's these recipes. You can find a whole bunch of them on the internet. I'll show you this one here. You get a, uh, a large open mouth jar. You throw some wheat in there, a pair of sweaty underwear. This is part of the recipe. I'm not making this stuff up. You leave it for 21 days and you come back and then you have mice. And people would do this. And apparent, I, I haven't tried it personally, but apparently you can do this and you can leave it for 21 days and come back and there's baby mice in there. Now, this is really basic biology. If you sat there and watched, you'd eventually see mama mice come and, and probably be attracted by the smell and, and the wheat husks. Uh, but this is a raging uh, scientific debate, particularly around things like cells and microscopic things. Because of course, uh, it's not so obvious where they're coming from. Never mind, what are they doing? What, that's a big question biologically, right? Um, so a lot of people were like skeptical, of course, of spontaneous generation, but how do you prove it? How do you do the science around this? So this guy came along, Francesco Reddy, uh, late 1600s, and uh, people were observing an obvious thing that if you leave your meat out, it gets spoiled. Eventually it gets maggots. But let me show you this picture here. Because maybe you don't know what a maggot is, or at least they didn't know what a maggot was at the time. A maggot is actually a baby fly. So what happens? You have meat sitting out. There were no fridges back then, remember? Uh, so it's sitting out in your home or the butcher shop, and a fly comes along and lays an egg. And the egg would be microscopic. So people don't see the eggs. All they see is eventually this worm-like maggot form. So what's the recipe for maggots? You just leave meat sitting around. So he was like suspecting maybe it has something to do with the flies. So he, uh, he did this experiment. You can see here, uh, we have this, uh, this jar and you put the meat in there and put this cork on it. And of course the skeptics are like, well, of course there's no maggots in there because it's not open to the air. It needs fresh air for the maggots to form. So he did a second experiment where he used this uh, cloth on there instead, some sort of cheesecloth. And if you look, there's no maggots on the meat. And actually the maggots started forming on the edge of the cheesecloth where the eggs were being laid. Uh, so this was an easy experiment for people to do at home and convince them that maybe spontaneous generation is not quite the thing. So I'm gonna show you one more experiment, then we'll do that kahoot, and then we can, um, and then that will be it for today. Uh, another person weighed in, this, in on this, particularly regarding cells and bacterial cells. And like I said, you know, what are these things and what are they doing? Uh, they're all over the place, it turns out, but we didn't know that. So here's Louis Pasteur, and Louis Pasteur, you know, had this debate about microorganisms believing that they were everywhere. And people are like, again, spontaneous generation, uh, you know, it, it was the answer for many people. And he said, look, let's do an experiment to see where these things are coming, at least deciding, you know, looking whether they're in the air or not. Uh, and so, again, looking at food spoilage, you can imagine if you have some sort of broth or soup, and you can see he has that in a flask there, and you leave it out, it's present to the air. Eventually, some sort of spore or microorganism will end up in there and spoil the whole thing. So he said, let's just try something a little different. So he heated the glass, he bent the neck glass, and uh, made what we call a swan neck flask. So swan neck flask, that's like the bird, the swan, right? You can see he's heating it with a Bunsen burner, and uh, the, the, the unique design of this is that if there are microbes in the air, they can get in the flask, but they kind of get stuck here at the neck, right about there. And so here's the thing, right? Uh, they get stuck in the neck, they don't end up in the broth, and they don't spoil the broth. So turns out Pasteur was right. In fact, there's one of Pasteur's flasks. It's in the Pasteur Institute in Paris, and it's been sitting there for more than 100 years, and it's still sterile. So no spontaneous generation, microbes are in the air. And uh, the next question is, what are these cells all about? And we'll talk about that next day. I was gonna say this one thing about um, uh, Louis Pasteur is that uh, it, you, you, know, you can break, break the neck in the flask or you can tip the flask up and uh, eventually it will cause contamination in there. So I'm just gonna finish off today with this Kahoot. So where is it? I gotta find it for you. Okay, there it is there. I'm gonna hit start. Okay, so there's Kahoot. So start up your app and you wanna type in the game pin and once everyone's joined, we'll start 
and uh, got some little questions for you here. All right, I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds. I think I've got half, half of the uh, students at the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. This is completely optional. You don't have to participate if you want, but hopefully they can have kind of fun. So Robert Hooke, who discovered named cells? Robert Hooke. Uh, Van Loon Hooke, he discovered the bacteria and other things in rainwater, but Robert Hooke looked at FD cork cells. So good job. It looks like it gives you points. So, you know, maybe this can be a running competition here. So good job, uh, Herrera, I think that's how you say your name, hopefully. Question two, what is your instructor's name? There's a nice picture of me. Wow, 100%. Good job. Hope you like my little jokes there. Oh, we're changing in the points here. Okay, last question. True or false? Lab start this week. Good. Looks like you guys were awake and everyone was listening. Um, yeah, so labs do start next week. We'll give you some more information on that uh, as, as we go along here. Um, so that's it for today. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll take them now as well. Um, if not, I guess I will uh, see you on whatever today is. Today's Wednesday. I'll see you on Friday. Uh, so hope you enjoyed the class. We're going to have lots of fun this semester. And uh, hopefully you will learn lots. And, and uh, like I said, feel free to send me questions. Anytime, I'll try to get back to you on that.